Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter or Google+, and please give us feedback. You can leave a review on iTunes to help other people find the show, send us a tweet, send us an email, leave us a message on Google+, you can leave a comment on our show notes, or you can also visit our new Discourse forum at discourse.pythonpodcast.com. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. I would also like to thank Hired, a job marketplace for developers, for sponsoring this episode of Podcast.init. Use the link hired.com slash podcast.init to double your signing bonus and get $4,000. We are recording today on December 30th, 2015, and your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. Today we are interviewing Eve Hilpisch about quantitative finance. Eve, could you please introduce yourself? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Eve. You said it already. Uh, I'm German. Um, I, my background actually is uh, uh, in math finance. I wrote my PhD thesis oh already back in 2000. I finished my PhD actually, and have been working in the industry since then. Um, so my my focus today is actually uh, that we're working uh, with Python for finance. Actually, I founded the company called the Python Quants, and there we focus actually on supporting um, small, medium size, as well as the biggest institutions that we have in the financial industry, like hedge funds, uh, big banks, uh, exchanges, other data service providers, and so forth. So we're also uh, doing uh, conferences in this in this context, and then much much more, like running meetup groups in uh, New York and London, actually. So it's, it's quite diverse, but actually, uh, the, the common field is Python for finance. This, this, this is what you can say. What I'm doing all day, all all week, all year, actually. Very cool. So, um, Eves, how did you get introduced to Python? Well, this is actually by incident. I was working for a technology client. Uh, it's well, like more than ten years. Uh, back then, uh, I was uh, working for this technology client in a consulting capacity. I wasn't involved in technology itself, but it was this particular project where I learned to know Python. And I thought, well, this might be actually a good language to do quantitative finance. Uh, back then, uh, maybe only a few have been using Python in this regard. Uh, when I started uh, using it and I talked to other people about it, they always say, well, Python is not very well suited to attack uh, the typical problems of quantitative finance because it's an interpreted language. It might be too slow, or they even say, well, it is too slow, you can't use it. Uh, but I think over the last 10 years, we have come a long way in the Python world. Um, all these prejudices, I would say, uh, they are no longer uh, true or valid these days. Uh, we have the amazing Python ecosystem that make Python a very good choice. So, But again, it was just by incident. I liked the language from the first day that I saw it. I thought it's so close to the mathematical syntax that you're used to use in, the, in, the, in quantitative finance. I, th I, I thought simply this must be a perfect match. And I guess uh, history, at least the last 10 years, uh, have provided lots of support uh, for my... Uh, back then, it was just a vision. It was just like a feeling that this might be a good fit. But uh, the biggest institutions in the world, like Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, they're heavy Python users these days. They prove right um, that Python is indeed a very good choice for finance. Yeah, it's definitely pretty amazing how quickly the ecosystem has grown up around the use cases for doing quantitative analysis and various forms of data science and other kinds of number crunching within the Python language and all the different uh, sort of native libraries that are that have bindings to help alleviate that issue with speed that you mentioned. So can you explain what quantitative finance is and also perhaps differentiate that from algorithmic trading? You yeah, well, quant finance, I, uh, at least as far as my thinking goes, I see three major sub-disciplines under quantitative finance. There are, of course, those people who work on the models, I would say, for example, to value complex uh, derivatives like options or hybrid uh, securities or or other structures where you might have embedded options. These are the guys who write down the equations, 
who try to solve them by yeah, <laughs> mere brain power, if you like. Uh, then the second pillar from my point of view is computational finance, where I say, well, now we have the model, but we have to implement that uh, by the means of, for example, Python, or typically what they use these days is C++ due to the speed and so forth. Um, this is the second pillar, the computational part. And then, of course, we have uh, what I call a financial data science, where there's this whole financial logistics um, topic that you need to cover in order to get your hands around the massive amounts of data, actually. Um, this is actually, from my point of view, uh, the closest part to algorithmic trading in that sense, and that you have to process masses of, of data. Um, you can speak of big data in this regard, but typically I understand that the big data more or less uh, unstructured data. What we see in quantitative finance is actually usually very structured data, which you can store in tabular form. So there is no need to attack these, uh, uh, let's say, very structured data sets, which might be big with the typical means uh, that are applied, for example, by Google or the Twitters of the world, uh, where the problems are completely different. Speaking, for example, of the, of the retail banking side, you have problems similar to the ones that are faced by Twitter and Google, but on the quantitative side, it's usually very structured data. Just think of kind of a table, a SQL-based uh, uh, table, or for example, a simple Excel spreadsheet where you have your numbers in such a, a two-dimensional spreadsheet form. Uh, this is data that we face in quantitative finance. But nevertheless, the financial logistics part is uh, equally uh, as important as in the other disciplines. So, uh, again, I see the three pillars, the theoretical part, the computation finance part, and the financial data science part, uh, if you like. Uh, at least this is my thinking. And you alluded to it a little bit, but I'm curious how common it is for Python to be used in an investment bank or hedge fund for the purpose of quantitative finance or possibly other uses as well. Well, I think uh, coming from... Uh, yeah, a history where Python hasn't played a role in the quantitative finance part. We usually see if finance is, if Python is used at all, kind of a blend of technologies uh, that are used in quantitative finance. Um, I said it before, major banks these days have implemented their analytics libraries, their derivatives analytics, their risk analytics libraries in C++ due to the speed advantage that the, these um, compiled languages provided. Uh, 10, 20 years uh, ago, actually. Uh, but again, you have to differentiate this uh, to maybe new startup funds, like uh, there are many, many hedge funds that even got started uh, in 2015, where many big shops uh, are closing their funds, actually. Um, this, this is one of the major headlines this, uh, this year about the hedge funds. Uh, uh, and these new shops, they, they saw the potential for Python to provide a unified technology platform uh, in the sense that Python might not be only used for prototyping purposes or to script something up quite quickly, but also for kind of the core technology and the core uh, analytics, be it risk analytics, derivatives analytics, or for the purpose of uh, implementing trading strategies and so forth. So it is used, but I think to a different degree, depending on, on the, the companies you're looking at. I mentioned the example before, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, um, their, their major uh, trading and risk management platform, which is called Quartz. Uh, the last number I heard is that they have about 12 million lines of Python code in production there, though it might be one of the biggest financial applications in the world, and they're obviously heavy uh, Python users. Others might be using it only to a smaller extent, but again, uh, all the big institutions these days, be it hedge funds, be it asset managers, or be it the big investment banks, uh, they're more or less using Python, but again, to a different degree, maybe. And just to dig a little bit deeper into the factors that contribute to the choice of whether or not to use Python in that kind of environment, I know you mentioned uh, having it as more of a unifying language, but I'm curious if you can just dig a bit more into that. Yeah, the unification uh, power of Python, I think, is one that is uh, yeah, dominant these days. Uh, when, you, when you start out and you can decide on your own, again, the example, uh, a team coming out of a big investment bank, they set up shop with their new fund, uh, their emerging managers, they can decide on what technology to start with. Obviously, for a big investment bank, this is not a choice when you say, well, I have millions of lines of code uh, in C++, there is no point, no business case in, in migrating that to Python. But if you start out anew, I guess this is kind of uh, the right thing to go these days, uh, to use Python. And many, many do that uh, these days, actually. But there are other factors as well. I mean, uh, it is kind of a, a hip language these days, so many people like to work with Python. And I guess it's also a factor when it comes to recruiting, that you say, well, we are, we are innovative, we use Python, you can work in Python here. 
they're not the old compiled languages that you need to use that you need to master. Um, uh, but again, there usually it's kind of a blend of technologies, and there's seldom people these days are writing uh, stuff only in one language. But Python might be a very good one when it comes to um, uh, fascinating <laughs> and acquiring people and get the best recruits out there in the market, actually. Uh, others, uh, I mentioned that before, uh, other factors uh, might be the ecosystem, of course. Uh, things like Pandas, data analytics library written back then or still supported by Wes McKinney. It's kind of a major uh, library where I see that people get drawn into Python solely by this particular library. So uh, when I give seminars or, or we're doing or running our conferences, there are very often people who come from a different background like R or MATLAB and I say, well, I'm so fascinated by, by what Python has to offer these days. But again, think back five years, um, we have come a long way when it comes to these libraries like Pandas or performance library, libraries like Thyson and Number, which make uh, Python really fast. So I think we have lots to offer and this might be, in the end, I guess, the, the most important thing that we have this particular uh, powerful, particularly powerful ecosystem, which I guess distinguishes Python, for example, um, uh, from languages like Ruby, which are which is pretty close uh, in terms of syntax, which is also quite nice. Many people like it, but the ecosystem for doing what we do in quantitative finance is mainly missing in most other languages that you might come up with uh, when it comes to the beauty of the language itself, but not the powerful or the power of the the ecosystem uh, which surrounds the language. This is definitely something that I think the Python community should consider marketing a little bit more aggressively in that. I've actually had this discussion a number of times of late. You know, Python is one of those languages that can tend to be polarizing in terms of if people have really strong opinions about the, you know, syntactic white space or whatever the case may be. And I've just been trying to tell people, I don't care. Like, even if you hate the language itself, you know, it does the ecosystem that has been built up around it deserves to be explored because. People are doing really interesting things with Python that just aren't happening in other programming language camps, at least not in the depth and diversity that they're happening here. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, uh, if you differentiate the, the work of a, of a developer who's writing like production code uh, to the work, uh, for example, of a quant analyst who is more or less doing interactive uh, work, and then you can say, for example, that pandas in and of itself might represent kind of a new, even higher language in a certain sense, because you can work with pandas alone these days, uh, which wraps actually all the nice libraries that are available in the ecosystem, like uh, PyTables for HDF5 storage, or Maplotlib for plotting, or NumExpression for parallel uh, numerical expression evaluation, and so forth. And you can, for example, if you are a non-computer scientist, a non-developer whatsoever, you can learn pandas as a language in itself. Not even taking too much care of what Python has to offer. So I, I'm playing with this uh, thought for quite a while. I'm thinking of kind of uh, more like executive level uh, people who might be interested in learning pandas alone. So what you're saying is, is completely right. Even if you, if you don't uh, like the language itself, the ecosystem around that, and pandas from, from my point of view is kind of the, the prime example in this case, uh, is so powerful and, and you find so many useful things that you might not find in other areas that it's always worth to have a look at least at, at, uh, at the specialized libraries in this regard. That's very interesting that you mentioned people coming to Python specifically just for pandas and using that on its own without paying attention to the fact that they're actually doing development in Python, the language. And it reminds me a lot of the experience that people have had with Ruby and Ruby on Rails, where people come to the Ruby community just to use Rails and for the first while that they're using it, don't even necessarily realize that Ruby is its own distinct entity apart from that framework. So it's... It's an interesting parallel to have that happening with pandas and using that to bring people to Python. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, usually people have problems and they want to solve their problems. And uh, only in the second instance, they care about the means in the sense that they are not religious about that. So, uh, again, the example is uh, pandas has been modeled more or less in the beginning after the data frame, which is, which is provided by R. But more and more people are coming to Python due to pandas these days because 
uh, the data frame that we have in pandas is much more powerful than the data frame that is available in R. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, the upside down, if you like, that people now are coming to us because we have something which was modeled in the first place after something that the R community had available for quite a while. So uh, this is uh, also illustrative from my point of view for, for the long way we have, we have come and what we have to offer these days also for people yeah, with, a, with a different uh, background and, and uh, yeah, a different education in this regard, actually. So, Eves, are there any performance bottlenecks or other considerations inherent in using Python for quantitative finance? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm always saying um, you can write really slow Python code. This is this is for sure. Uh, and there are many, many traps that you can tap into. Um, the problem with Python um, is that you can achieve uh, the same result by, I don't know, a multitude of different ways because we have multiple paradigms that you can use, you have different idiomatic ways that you can choose uh, to reach the result and so forth. So for many people coming to Python uh, with a different background, it might be a little bit tricky to get it right um, in the first place. Uh, for example, or the major example is that many, many algorithms in quantitative finance, uh, when implemented in any kind of um, language, um, programming language, are based in the end of, of a loop or even a nested loop. And everybody knows that uh, Python loops are slow, and therefore some are reasoning that, well, quantitative finance is in the end about looping or nested looping, and Python is bad at looping, so Python must be bad for quantitative finance. But again, when you write the programs and the algorithms right, you will uh, try to avoid writing loops on the Python level as far as possible. For example, using uh, the powerful vectorization capabilities of NumPy, uh, where the looping is, so to say, um, delegated to the C level, uh, so, so to say, in the machine room of NumPy, actually, where everything happens at the speed of C code, because NumPy is more or less completely implemented in C. There's also a Fortran part, but usually what you're using as a default is the, is the C part of the implementation of NumPy, of the NDRA object. And this is then, in the end, uh, quite, uh, quite fast. Actually, but you have to know that people coming from R or, for example, MATLAB, they might know that. But people coming, for example, with a C++ or C sharp background or Java, where they're used to write their uh, their loops, uh, yeah, they might be inclined to, to write their loops in Python as well. And this might be, for example, a trap where you can tap into it, where you say, well, performance is, is all but what I what I expected or what we need here for this particular application. Um, and this might be tricky in the first place, but I guess a good training or there are so many tutorials available on the web to teach uh, that stuff. Uh, this might uh, yeah, get you around the uh, the traps that I was mentioning before. Uh, and in the end, if this is not enough, that you say, for example, working with NumPy is nice, but my, my special problem cannot be cast into a setting where full vectorization or, for example, I cannot afford to allocate uh, too much memory. Uh, uh, for the vectorization. Then there are other libraries. I mentioned, for example, a number before, which might help you, for example, with your, with your specialized uh, loops, nested loops. And it's a very powerful tool to um, dynamically compile your pure Python code, if you like, to uh, machine code. And then you get a speed again, uh, but in a more or less than customized fashion. So there are bottlenecks, if you like, if you're doing it wrong. But usually, if you know how to do your stuff for quantitative finance, for computational finance, uh, then Python might be as fast as any other language that uh, you use usually for these um, particular topics. Uh, you asked before f about algorithmic trading or if you think for high frequency trading. I mean, when we speak of the milliseconds that matter in these particular areas, then Python might indeed not be the right choice. So um, I always differentiate when I say, well, for the typical uh, big data problems, uh, Python is, hasn't been developed actually also not for the for the fastest things in the world, but Python can interact with all the technologies that are used there, uh, both in the big data uh, world and in the high frequency and in the in the high performance uh, area, if you like. Uh, but Python, in and of itself, was never designed to attack these particular problems. But again, as a general language, as a general programming language, attacking the regular problems, let's say that the 98% of typical problems. Python might be uh, actually a good choice uh, to go for. But again, you have to take care of the idioms of the approaches that you use because otherwise you might end up indeed with slow, uh, non-performing Python code. That's really interesting that you and, and a few other people also have brought up the slowness around loops and, and iteration in Python. I wonder if in you know Guido and, and all the other folks sort of you know working on Python.next and, and, and investigating the future of the language, I wonder if any thought is being given towards how that performance 
issue might be mitigated? I think for sure they are working on that, but by the very design, uh, there are limits to solving this particular issue. Uh, first of all, Python is a dynamically typed language, so the interpreter has to decide during runtime what kind of type it faces. This brings a lot of generality, but also obviously lots of overhead. Uh, compared to a compiled language where you say, well, this is a float, this is that, this is this. <laughs> in Python, you can pass kind of anything, for example, into a function, and then the interpreter has to decide what has passed to the function. And for example, there might be functions that work on a float, that work on an array, and they might even also work on a string object. Uh, this is the nice point about that, about dynamic typing, <laughs> that you get lots of generality. But this brings, again, uh, the overhead with it. Um, on the other end, yeah, I mean, it is, it is uh, an interpreted language. And if we speak of the C Python implementation, this is as it is. Of course, we have uh, the other Python versions like the PyPy project, where you have something like just in time compiling. And there we usually see speed ups of like six to eight times uh, compared to the, compared to the uh, uh, interpreted version, actually. So obviously there are projects implemented, but in the end, if you stick to the two major paradigms that you have a dynamically typed language and you have an interpreted one, then there might be limits to speeding up uh, the the, um, the loops. But in the end, from my point of view, for quantitative finance, what we are talking about this is actually not a problem. But if you have, if you have, for example, a, a big application or let's say um, a module from a, from an analytics library, then usually you have kind of two or three spots only where this bottleneck might arise, arise where you say, well, here is kind of my nested loop, which is too slow. And then you can pick that particular part out uh, and maybe vectorize it as a first approach, or you do dynamic compiling, or you do a static compiling using Thyson and then interface with the, with the compiled version, and then the bottleneck, so to say, has vanished. Uh, you don't have to write, like, if you have a thousand lines of code and maybe five or ten lines only might represent the bottleneck, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing to get a speed up that you're looking for. Uh, just usually uh, is enough to rewrite or to compile, dynamically, statically compile the five or ten lines of code which represent the bottleneck. And this is kind of a nice thing. You can start out with pure Python, you profile your code, you say, well, here, here we see kind of uh, <laughs> where the slowness comes from, the execution, and then you go, uh, you go on and, and improve uh, this particular part. And in the end, you might be as fast as with kind of a completely compiled version of what you have been written. And uh, just to go a little bit deeper into the weeds for profiling your code, do you just use the standard uh, built-in profiling module from the standard library, or are there any other tools that you like to leverage for that purpose? Yeah, there are, there are multiple options available. What we kind of use is kind of uh, usually the very standard. But uh, if you have experience, you usually don't need to uh, to run it through a profiling engine uh, to say, well, this is where the bottleneck is. Uh, the majority majority of algorithms in the end look like the same and with a little bit of experience you know where the where the where the important parts are which you have to uh, yeah compile in the end so this is more or less kind of a, more a thing of experience than of profiling in the end i would say actually for what we do so what kinds of background are typical and necessary for getting started in quantitative finance i think here we also have come a long way um Back then, I would say so in the in the 80s, even in the 90s, um, what they call the people who did quantitative finance, they were usually called the rocket scientists. And, and the major reason for this was because they have been rocket scientists, actually. Uh, many people had their background in physics or mechanical engineering or in mathematics or, or some similar very formal field where they got the, the necessary uh, math education to attack quantitative finance. Uh, problems these days when you have a look at the educational market you have many many specialized degrees uh, be them called the master of financial engineering master of quantitative finance um, so again we've come a long way in a sense that we have today the the, the education industry the universities that support um, education in this regard and i guess people interested in getting into quantitative finance um, they usually go that route that they do their bachelor and, and later on get their specialization with a typical program. Um, and I don't know how many there are alone in New York and in London, uh, where they get their master or even later on they go on and write a PhD thesis in this regard. Um, so this is kind of the background, um, that is typically, I would say these days required that you know how to program, 
they learn, for example, C++ and more and more Python these days, obviously, um, and uh, they get the, the math education that they need to, to work in this particular field. But obviously, there are other people that might come with, for example, a math background or an engineering background, uh, and they are already in their professional careers and they want to get into the field. Then there's also um, a professional education market. Um, for example, Fitch Learning, they offer kind of the very famous uh, CQF, the Certificate in Quantitative Finance. I think since more than 12 years, I this year got a lecture for the program, so they introduced Python as well. Here we see that Python is getting crowned in this part uh, of, the, of the spectrum as well, uh, because uh, Randeep Gook, which is the academic director, um, he said, well, we have to keep up with the times, and Python obviously has become a force in quantitative finance, and we want to introduce Python into the curriculum, and, and here we go. So I'm teaching uh, quant finance, or actually computational finance, I must, I must specify, given my own uh, subclassification um, based on Python in this program right now. And I guess going forward, more and more Python will also be uh, included in this um, professional education program. We also, for example, uh, discussing, and we will provide this probably next year for the first time to do a certification in Python for quantitative finance, which is uh, a little bit shorter, but a little bit more specialized. So for people who say, well, I might have a background, for example, in financial engineering with a master's, but I've never done any Python. Uh, but I know, for example, what the flexible stochastic differential equation is for the geometric Brownian motion. Uh, then they might learn during this certification, which will be um, over four days uh, with, a, with kind of a final test, a final exam. Um, then, then they will learn how to apply Python, actually, um, in, in this particular field. So there are many, many ways. Usually these days, I guess people who are interested, they, they start out uh, uh, studying this at university. But again, there's also kind of a market uh, which uh, provides professional education uh, offerings for those who are already in their career and now want to shift focus or want to deepen their knowledge in this particular field. Yeah, it's interesting how new technologies have given rise to completely new classes of occupation that didn't exist before computers became so ubiquitous and also how software in general has allowed a number of people to reimagine their careers at various points without necessarily having to go all the way back to school and get another degree or take a significant amount of time off of the work that they're already doing in order to gain new certifications. So what kinds of libraries or algorithms in Python are useful for the day-to-day -day work of a quant? Well, actually, this is pretty similar to what data scientists use. I mean, uh, data scientists might be a little bit more popular field for which Python is used. Um, but we in quant finance use more or less the same tool set. So it all starts out with the, with the scientific stack, as it's usually called, uh, which is based more or less uh, completely on NumPy, which gives the uh, ND array object for numerical computations based on array structures. Um, then obviously I mentioned it quite a few times already, uh, we're using pandas for data crunching, for visualization, for example. Uh, and these are already the two major libraries I'm working with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, there are much more specialized libraries and so forth, but uh, I guess these two are the workhorse actually these days. Um, I really like uh, storing data in HDF5 format, which is a very fast format, uh, binary format to store data almost at the speed of the hardware uh, that is available. So usually even working on a, on a small MacBook that I have in front here, I get to uh, write and read speeds of uh, 500 megabytes per second with Python that is already built in. Uh, this is my example that I'm usually mentioning when I say, well, the, the, the HPC part when it comes to I.O. is usually built in in Python. Other languages, they have to uh, yeah, crap a little bit more with the <laughs> input-output um, part. And there are many others. There's so many, so many nice uh, libraries and stuff out there. But I think in the end, it depends on the very problem that, that you were attacking. Uh, but again, I can only stress the two ones that are the workhorse. It's, it's uh, NumPy and it's Pandas. And I mentioned already the, the, the uh, performance um, libraries, which might be useful. But this more or less on a case-by-case -case basis. 
that you might want to use number, for example, when you when you face a nested loop, which cannot be vectorized or which you want to implement in a, in a memory efficient way, and all the the other nice uh, things that we have like Thyson and so forth. So, but again, it, it is and it stays the the scientific stack which is used in almost any kind of scientific discipline or the data science part. Um, and uh, quantitative finance, at least in this regard, is not that different from the other application areas of Python and the and the ecosystem surrounding it. So talking a little bit more about the actual data that is manipulated and used for powering these decisions, I'm curious, I guess, where the different sources are. So is it all just market financial data? Is there proprietary data that companies bring into play? And also uh, how useful or prevalent is semantic analysis of various news sources when trying to reach decisions about what sorts of trades or investments to make? Uh, one point I mentioned also again before is kind of that we usually, on the, at least on the quantitative finance side, with very structured data, and, and the structured data is typically kind of a financial time series, mm -hmm. which says you have your date time stamps, where say on the, on the 2nd of March last year at uh, 11 o'clock, uh, we had, for example, an index level for the S&P 500 of XYZ. Um, and this then you have, for example, over 30 years, you might have this on a daily basis or on a minute bar basis or even on the second level. Uh, but nevertheless, the structure of the data is the same. It's typically financial time series. Um, and these financial time series are generally provided by, at least in the professional context, by the professional data uh, providers like Bloomberg and Thomson Reuters. Which, uh, by the way, both of uh, both of them provide Python-based uh, wrappers around their APIs. So it's very, very convenient usually uh, uh, to interface with the data they provide from a Python level. Actually, it's not where it could be or should be. Uh, I heard many people complaining uh, about practical issues in this regard, but at least there is the, the possibility to interface from Python to these sources. Uh, but there are other areas as well where you can get financial data, and this is kind of a very nice. A development I see in our market uh, that we not only have open source and we have the GitHub and the meetup movement and you name it, we also have open data, which is coming more and more. And one of uh, the bigger players in this regard in our field, in the financial field, is Quanda. It's called Quanda, uh, which provides kind of a unified interface to uh, I don't know how many open data sources actually. Um, for example, my, one of my examples I, I use on, the, on our platform on DataPark.io is interfacing with Quandl and analyzing Bitcoin historical data for, with regard to the exchange rate to the US dollar, with regard to the number of Bitcoins issued, with regard to the volume of Bitcoins traded per day, and so forth. So this, is, this is kind of an example of what kind of data you get there. You, you also get data from Quandl uh, for free in an open, standardized fashion uh, for uh, yeah, historical data, for example, for indices, for... Uh, commodities for uh, foreign exchange rates and so forth. So, but not only that, there are a wealth of, of different uh, data sources that you can tap into there. So if you have never heard of it, just give it a try, have a look at it. Uh, there's, a, there's a standard REST, RESTful API, JSON base, and you can easily interface uh, with Quantum, not only obviously from Python, but with any language, uh, because it's, it's such a nice API that they provide. And this is kind of a major trend, which is uh, really useful. When I think back when I wrote my, my diploma thesis and my PhD thesis, getting uh, even small chunks of data was, was really painful or in the end costly. So I remember one instance where I had to pay my professor like uh, back then when I studied 20 Deutschmarks for a very small uh, data set that I needed. So it was much money back then for myself actually. But these days when, when you study in this field, you have so many open data sources that you can tap into. Uh, I think the most popular one because it's uh, around since quite a while is the, the Yahoo Finance data set where you can, for example, from Pandas quite easily interface with and if you're, for example, interested in the, in the stock quotes of uh, German Daimler Benz or a famous car manufacturer or for the German DAX index or to this end for the VIX volatility index in the United States, you get the data for free uh, from Yahoo, for example. So uh, this is kind of a major trend that I see uh, coming or becoming even more uh, force in the future that we not have only uh, open source, but also open data in that sense that people can uh, easily work with. Um, with regard to uh, the other part of your question was with regard to semantic analytics, I have seen quite a few talks and I know quite a few people who are working on that, uh, but I don't have a coherent opinion on that. This is not a field that we are working with, so news analytics is an active field. 
Uh, there are companies who exclusively focus on that, like Ravenpack, for example, is one provider of, uh, so to say, insights based on uh, semantic analysis. Um, but again, this is neither a field uh, which I would consider one of our expertise, nor do I have kind of a coherent view on, on how far-fledged it's used. I think all the big players in the world when it comes to the buy side, the hedge funds and asset managers, they have, have tried it out. But I don't know uh, how far they really base in the end their decision to trade on this kind of information. I've seen quite good research results. Actually, where they presented their, their studies, but uh, in the end, the proof lies in using it uh, to make real money. And there, I, I can't mention numbers where I say, well, this, uh, this or that shop has used it uh, um, to generate, I don't know, three percentage points or plus over kind of a benchmark whatsoever. So I'm not an expert in that. Maybe others uh, might uh, have uh, stronger views on that. So... This next question that I had may potentially have been somewhat off the mark, and you'll forgive me if so. Um, but in any case, is Python actually used to enact the trades? What protocols, APIs, and libraries are used in this process? Uh, the first part of the answer is Python actually used to enact the trades, I would say, uh, for sure, yes. But uh, I think, depending again on the company you look at, it might be from completely different angles that the input uh, um, comes from the Python script or application or whatever is used there. So some might even uh, implement their, um, their complete uh, trade process based on, on, on Python. Others might only use it, for example, to analyze data, come up with an investment idea and then implement it later on using a different technology. So uh, from the one end, doing it completely based on Python, like automated, Algorithmic, uh, algorithmic trading to just like being a supportive tool in order to come up with ideas and to back up ideas, so to say. Um, I can see uh, Python yeah, used in many, many places in, in this particular regard. When it comes to protocols, APIs, and libraries, um, the first part is not that, yeah, not that easy to answer. I mean, there are so so many different applications, so many different areas where, where it is used. Um, I wouldn't say that there is kind of a, a very standard. What we see these days, obviously, is JSON-based uh, APIs. We can easily interact with, uh, for example, online brokers, for example, where they have standardized APIs. But again, uh, shifting from one online broker to the next, uh, you might encounter a completely different API. So I don't see any kind of uh, real standardization in this regard. Uh, when it comes to libraries, Actually, um, they are also, uh, at least when I give my talks at, at uh, Python conferences, what I mention usually, usually is that this is kind of, I wouldn't say a blind spot actually, that we don't have financial libraries, but we don't have really standardized ones yet, or um, I'll say powerful enough libraries yet. Uh, we have the, the amazing uh, Python ecosystem we have been talking about <laughs> already a few times uh, with NumPy pandas and so forth. Uh, but there is not kind of when you say, well, which one is the financial library I should use when I want to trade this or that? Uh, this is still missing. What we are working on since quite a while is a, a standardized library, which we call DX Analytics. you find all the information uh, on the website. Just, just Google it or go to dx-analytics.com. Uh, um, but this currently has a strong focus on derivatives analytics, which might not be the focus of the majority of people uh, who use Python for finance. But I think when it comes to derivatives and risk analytics and portfolio analytics, uh, we might uh, have to offer some special things here. So this is also one of my focuses for next year to build out our library. And I'm discussing uh, right now with uh, a few bigger partners who might support uh, our actions in this regard um, to build out DX analytics to more or less kind of a full-fledged library covering also backtesting, trading, more on the portfolio analytics sides and, and uh, including more models like uh, currently we're working, for example, on a LIBOR market model, which is kind of a very complex one, uh, but heavily and often used when it comes to the interest rate space. Um, so in this regard, we have been uh, too weak, if you like. Uh, but again, on the other part, there's the derivatives the analytics part, and there the focus is on equities. Um, I think our library is already quite strong and there it is also used kind of in practice for, for some of our clients 
where we do kind of derivatives and portfolio analytics on a regular basis, have implemented a part of their analytics uh, infrastructure based on our open source library, DX Analytics. Um, and there are others, of course, not only ours. There's, for example, the Zipline library, uh, which was open sourced by Quantopian, which is an algorithmic platform, and the crowdsourced uh, hedge fund, actually, uh, they open source Zipline, which has a focus on backtesting trading strategies, so they are more on the trading side. And they just recently open sourced another library, which they call Pyfolio, uh, which is more or less about the uh, performance um, estimation of different trading strategies. So the two, the Zipline and the Pyfolio, are closely intertwined. The one is for backtesting and coming up with the trading strategies, and the other one is for um, estimating uh, the performance and giving lots of st statistics for different trading strategies in practice. Um, and this is actually what, what their platform is about, uh, yeah, providing people an environment to, uh, to generate uh, trading ideas and to test them in practice, uh, either by paper trading or going direct to uh, interactive brokers where they then can trade with uh, real money if they like, if they have uh, enough trust in their, in their trading strategies. So again, there are some uh, financial libraries. Another one I'm at, uh, I could mention is uh, Pythalesians, actually. Uh, written by a friend of mine, Saeed Amen. Um, he has also focused more on the trading side and the data crunching side. He has, for example, interfaces to Bloomberg. Uh, but again, we, we are missing kind of this, this one, this single library. And I imagine something like Pandas, or what, what Pandas has accomplished for this data science part uh, here, kind of a crowned work where say, uh, this covers kind of 80, 90% of what we typically see on a daily basis. And I'm imagining something uh, here in the future, and again, my my priority, and this is written here on my whiteboard to the right of my desk uh, for 2016, is to build out our library as far as possible, and and maybe to get to a standard and to benchmark library, if you like, in this regard, that we can say, well, Python also has kind of this one particular financial library where you can go to and you find kind of uh, a multitude of useful things that you need to do quantitative and and computational finance. Very cool. I want to ask you a question about DX analytics in particular. So obviously, I have a very limited understanding of the intricacies of derivatives trading. I did sort of do a, a chunk of reading around the market crash of a few years ago that a lot of people sort of blame derivatives trading for taking a, a rather large part in the, the American market crash, at least. Does DX analytics sort of help you analyze the actual worth of a given derivative or like does it help you try to make smart investment choices around are these derivatives good investments or not like what what kinds of things can you do with it well i think it's not as simple as that unfortunately so a typical derivatives analytics library has not the main objective at least from my point of view that you say well this is kind of a good derivative or not it always depends on what you want to do what your expectations are what your kind of base position is um usually um so these libraries only help in coming up with yeah, valuations, value estimates, if you like, um, and also with kind of uh, risk figures, the so-called creeks. I mean, now we're getting a little bit technical, uh, which you need to manage your derivatives position. In this regard, our library might help people because we're implementing kind of a, a rather new approach when it comes to front office analytics. Uh, to get uh, a little bit of a more comprehensive picture of what uh, a derivatives portfolio uh, might uh, be all about in a sense that uh, we provide much more uh, statistical information because the whole library is based on is based on Monte Carlo simulation which which allows you to uh, get a complete picture of the of the distribution for example uh, to make it a little bit more concrete, so I don't want to use too many technical terms, technical quant finance terms. Uh, what we do with the library, for example, if you have a, if you think of a derivatives portfolio which consists of ten uh, different options, uh, complex derivatives, um, then there might be kind of subtle interactions between the ones when, for example, the market moves when you're when you're trading, for example, options on the S and P 500 and so forth. What we do with the library is what is typically done in the back office these days. Uh, but we do it as a front office approach in the sense that we do Monte Carlo simulation for the front office analytics. And this allows us, for example, to get the complete distribution of, uh, of uh, the uh, possible future payoffs of such a complex portfolio in the sense that we're implementing, for example, 250,000 or even a million simulations for a complete portfolio. So in the end, again, ending up with not only kind of a single point estimate that we say, well, 
the portfolio has currently a worth of say one million, we get kind of a distribution of the of the potential future values, and in this sense, actually, uh, we get a, a more complete and more comprehensive picture when it comes to the analysis of these portfolios. But I wouldn't say that DX analytics in the first place really helps you in deciding uh, which options to choose and so forth. This is driven more or less either by necessity, uh, given the portfolio that you have already, or by the simply the strategy you want to implement. But when it comes to analyzing your positions and what, what you uh, have right now and what the future might look like, then DX analytics uh, might really help in providing a little bit more insight than the typical approaches allow you. And this is, I guess, uh, mainly true because we have implemented something which is very computationally demanding in a sense uh, uh, that you need uh, lots of compute power, lots of memory actually. Uh, but this was actually one of the, or these are two hypotheses that we started with, that, that we said, well, in these days when we start implementing a new library, uh, we shouldn't care too much about restriction when it comes to compute power. We today have easy scalability, we have easy means to parallelize, uh, parallelize code execution, even with Python, this is easily accomplished. So we started out saying, no matter how computationally demanding an approach might be, if it's a better approach, let's go for it. So these are the major premises, if you like, that we say, well, we work, at least with the working hypothesis, that we say uh, compute and memory um, actually are unlimited, are available, or at least all that, all that we need is affordable these days. <laughs> this is in the end uh, what we see there. Uh, 10 or 20 years ago, where cloud infrastructure and what we see today, um, or what we have, at least uh, available with a few clicks actually, and a few dollars actually, uh, hasn't been available, you might have thought differently. But we started out doing this uh, on the premise that we said, well, compute and, and memory are not binding for what we for what we do. So let's go for the best numerical methods, and, and even if they might be a little bit more complex. So in that sense, uh, you have to pay a price for the additional insights, but I, I think uh, you mentioned the crisis. Uh, when you can avoid the next crisis, uh, I wouldn't go as far as that, but when you can avoid a personal crisis or a portfolio crisis, I think this is uh, when, when, it pays, uh, when it pays off that you have invested a little bit more maybe in the compute power uh, that you need to do that. So could you please walk us through how a simple analysis using DX analytics might work? Actually, um, I mentioned before, this is all based on global uh, valuation approach. It's kind of a technical term, which in the end means that all the risk factors that you need to model your portfolio are modeled non-redundantly. Uh, for example, again, think of the S&P 500, for example. Uh, you might start uh, modeling the S&P 500 with a model which you think is kind of a good choice. Uh, the most simple one might be a geometric Brownian motion, which dates back to 1973 where Plex, Coles, and Merton published their path-breaking uh, research about the valuation of European options. Uh, but we also provide in DX Analytics uh, much more sophisticated models involving stochastic volatility or jump uh, diffusion parts and so forth. Uh, so you have a great choice of different models that you can use. Once you have modeled your risk factors, again, think of the S&P 500 or the Eurostox 50, for example, being uh, me here in Europe, um, then you go on and model the, um, the derivatives positions that you have, for example, think of a European call option on the S&P 500 and maybe an American option on the Eurostox 50. So then you have your two uh, different options based on two different risk factors. Uh, and uh, the next step would then be to combine that to a derivatives portfolio, how it is called in DX Analytics. Uh, you have, for example, to define whether the risk factors are uh, correlated. Here in this case, we would guess yes. Uh, the S&P 500 and the Euro stocks, they might not be perfectly correlated, but there is probably some correlation, some positive correlation. Uh, you model that, uh, you provide all the information, the market environment information to the portfolio class, and the portfolio class in the end then takes care of the valuation, um, taking care of all the interdependencies of the correlations, uh, the random numbers are generated, the simulation. Are, are carried out, and they are carried out in kind of consistent uh, fashion that you say, well, if we do five, 500,000 simulations for the Euro stocks and the S&P 500, then you can be sure in the end that they are done in a coherent and consistent manner that you can add up values path by path, uh, scenario by scenario, and that you have in the end risk 
uh, statistics that are consistent in the sense that everything has been modeled consistently, everything has been simulated consistently, and you end up with something where you say, well, we are here uh, in a very consistent world and we can trust the numbers, at least when it comes to the aggregation. And this is what I always had in mind and what global valuation uh, is in the end all about. And I, and I stress that point because sometimes you, you see uh, derivatives libraries used in the market where they use, for example, one numerical method like a binomial or a trinomial uh, a lattice approach for the one option, then they use maybe Monte Carlo simulation for a more complex one, and then they use a finite difference scheme for the third one, uh, and they say, well, the first has a value of 5, the next of 10, and, and the third one of 20, and then they add up the numbers, but uh, I'm always a little bit, yeah, well, I think it's a little bit uh, suspicious uh, that they say, well, I have three different methods. They spit out numbers, and in the end, I simply add these numbers up. Um, so what we were always looking for is kind of the unified approach, which, again, costs a little bit more compute power, but uh, we then end up with consistent numbers when it comes to values and risk. Um, so, uh, and again, we have the software and the hardware available, which allows us to do things uh, which weren't possible 10 or 15 years ago. And continuing uh, this conversation about some of the work you've done with uh, your company, the Python Quants, what other kinds of services do you provide and what kinds of organizations typically hire you for that? Well, again, it's all centered around Python for finance. Um, so we, I would say we cover more or less the complete value chain in this regard. Um, so we provide technology. I mentioned DX Analytics before, but we have also an offering where we provide a, an interactive, uh, yeah, data science financial analytics platform, uh, which is called datapark.io, uh, which is a link uh, people might want to have a look at. You can sign up, there are free trials, and usually for the, uh, for the, for the personal individual accounts, uh, we don't charge anything and they remain open, um, at least uh, for the moment. Um, this is in a professional context, we call that the quant platform. I think the quant platform might be a little more expressive in a sense that we always imagine a platform where quants start working, doing their stuff, implementing things, and in the end, not only doing interactive uh, analytics, for example, but also deploy, for example, a Python-based application. But not only Python, I mean, the, the, uh, the platform itself is more or less uh, language agnostic. It's centered around the Jupyter Notebook, which is, I guess, uh, the most amazing tool that our ecosystem has to offer. Uh, but recently, they um, they made it completely language agnostic. So we, for example, also provide Julia on the platform. We provide R as a, as a language on the platform and much, much more. Um, so technology is uh, one part of what we do at the Python Quants. Again, the Quant platform or Data Park IO is our infrastructure where people can work on. DX Analytics is kind of the financial library that people can use to attack their more sophisticated derivatives and risk analytics problems. Um, and a few more minor things that we provide, but these are the two major pillars, actually. Uh, then around that, uh, I have also written uh, a few books. Uh, my one book from O'Reilly is called Python for Finance. It was published last year, just before Christmas, um, 2014. Actually, it's, it's selling quite well <laughs> all across uh, the world, so I'm really happy about that. I think it's also an indicator uh, for the popularity of Python and finance these days. Then this July, my second book came out. It's called Derivatives Analytics with Python. And actually, taking the two books together is actually a very good starting point. And more or less, uh, all what DX Analytics is about is explained in the combination of these two books. So uh, we have, of course, a website. I mentioned before, dx-analytics.com. But if you want to understand what's going on behind the scenes of DX Analytics, this is explained in the books Derivatives Analytics with Python and Python for Finance, actually. Um, and Python for Finance is also the book that I typically use when I teach uh, Python classes, be it public ones or corporate ones. Uh, and this brings me to the next part of what we do. Uh, we do trainings. Um, and I mentioned before, there are public ones, for example, during our for Python Quants conference series and also corporate customized ones uh, that we do on a regular basis for our clients. Um, and um, actually uh, around that or typically in the context of these uh, workshops, and we call them workshop in London and boot camps in New York. Uh, we have also our for Python Quants conference. Uh, this is actually the uh, next thing that we do. We are, we're doing our own events. And this is already, uh, we have 
uh, done already four for Python Quants conferences. Next year we will again do at least two. Uh, the next one will most probably be uh, at the end of April in New York again, and then at the end of the year again in London. Uh, and we are thinking of doing it in Asia as well, but uh, this is not yet fixed. But at least there are plans, and I hope that will uh, that it will materialize uh, this uh, next year, 2016, that we will uh, see the for Python Quants conference series in um, in uh, uh, Asia as well. Then, in addition to that, I've also done a conference in Germany, uh, which is called Open Source for Quant Finance in cooperation with uh, Deutsche Börse. Um, and usually what we do with these conferences is that we do this in cooperation with uh, bigger companies which have uh, uh, venues and infrastructure. The For Python Quant series, which, which I mentioned before, is done in cooperation with uh, Fitch Learning and the CQF Institute. Um, and this brings me to the next kind of event that we do. This is uh, our, uh, uh, it's the biggest meetup I'm running is in London, which is called Python for Quant Finance. Uh, we have now more than 1,100 members in this group, and it's quite an active group. We have um, seven to eight bigger meetups with uh, around 100 people per year in London. Um, and it's, uh, again, quite an active group, and it all is centered around Python for Quant Finance. We have uh, typically speakers from very diverse uh, fields in our industry, and it's always very, very useful, I guess, for all the participants. So if you're located in London, uh, give it a try, and I'm pretty sure at the end of January or beginning of February we'll have our next one uh, there again. And this is supported usually by uh, Thomson Reuters, which is the partner there. Um, so we are pretty happy that we have these uh, strong big partners which support uh, our purpose and, and which makes it uh, possible that we can do these uh, amazing events um, around the globe, actually. And what we live off, actually, uh, this is the last part, uh, but not the least one, is uh, consulting and development work. So uh, when it comes to revenues and income streams, uh, the consulting and the, and the development part are by far the, the most important ones that we consult uh, bigger uh, financial institutions or asset managers or um, yeah, exchanges, uh, hedge funds, and so forth when it comes to Python for quant finance. And there, it is very, very different what we do there. For example, I mentioned before, uh, applying DX analytics in practice, uh, writing production code that we've implemented for a very big institution, risk-based uh, models uh, based on Python and so forth. So it's quite diverse, but again, in the end, it's all about Python for finance, and in particular, uh, the computational finance uh, part and the financial data science part is what we focus on. Um, and yeah, you see, we are only a small company, but this is what we do on a daily basis. And I think we cover almost all the bases uh, when it comes to this uh, niche of the market. It's very cool that you folks have managed to keep the, you know, keep the lights on and, and get enough consulting income and yet have that work allow you to contribute back to open source. Because I know sometimes big enterprise is not exactly open source friendly. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. I mean, uh, in the end, but uh, yeah, I've always this discussion, but living out of open source, I think you should contribute back uh, to open source. And um, it's all, also kind of a model that you can choose these days. And I guess the, the whole culture and, and the infrastructure have changed kind, kind of a bit that you can say, well, you can even live off your open source work. Um, and this is kind of fascinating. They say, well, you share with the world, uh, people contribute back. And you can still make a living out of something that you share, which might be counterintuitive for people um, yeah, who are not used to these things. But more and more, and I've seen and I've joined that, uh, enjoyed that over the year, the people saying, well, if what you did, for example, inspired me to open source, uh, for example, the, the one example that I mentioned from Saeed Amin, uh, from the Thalesians, that he said, well, I've seen so many uh, good talks about people who argued why it is good to open source libraries. And this actually... Uh, helped me made up my mind and, and make the decision to open source Python license as well. So this is actually something that I really enjoy, that people pick up uh, the idea and the culture and say, well, we go that way. Uh, but on the other hand, we still have proprietary technology, for example, the, the, the platform part and what we provide there is not open source yet, I would say. Um, I didn't see the point to do that, but again, here we provide it for free, more or less, so we have many, many students working on the platform. We have a few thousand users on the platform, and I know that many students and so forth that might not have the budget uh, to afford kind of professional environment like that, they're really happy that they can use that for free, uh, this nice service, integrated platform. So we try our best to provide uh, good value here back to the community as well, even if this 
particular thing is not uh, open sourced yet again. So is there anything that we should have asked you but didn't? Uh, or are there any places where our listeners can help contribute to the open source work that you folks do? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we are, we are running a few websites, so it's typically a little bit difficult to point people to a single uh, page. But a good starting point for people who are interested in what we do, and there you find uh, almost all the links to the other stuff, like to the books, uh, to the media group, uh, to the events pages, and so forth, is our company page, which is uh, http uh, um, slash slash tpq.io, again, tpq.io for the Python quant. Um there you find again links to many, many other places and resources. You find the link, for example, uh, again to uh, DX Analytics. We have, of course, uh, uh, our GitHub repo uh, up with uh, the code of DX Analytics. You can try it out on, on uh, the Quant platform. Uh, the link for that is quant-platform.com uh, if you prefer more the data uh, park uh, styling. Actually, the technology behind it is the same, but the styling is a little bit different. You can use datapark.io. Um, it's more or less the same. Um, so go to these places, have a look, and if you have questions, yeah, just uh, either drop me an email, you find their contact details, or you can also follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is um, dygh, or just Google me up. Uh, you should find lots of uh, information about myself. Um, um, yeah, I see you're, you're writing it down here. Actually, uh, but Twitter is kind of a good way to stay in touch and to see what we are doing. You get usually the latest news with regard to conference we're doing or if there's an upcoming meetup uh, and so forth. Um, so it's kind of a good way to keep up um, and to get it in a more interactive fashion. Uh, and again, go to tpq.io and then you'll find uh, many, many links to many, many other resources that you can use. Also to my private website, hillpish.com where I usually store all the presentations that I give, uh, where you also find the uh, videos and so forth. Uh, and um, yeah, I think there's a lot there. And people who are interested, just, just get in touch. I'm happy to discuss uh, things. So I see, uh, again, my, uh, my Twitter handle is J, like Johannes. It's D-Y, not G. It's J, H. Well... Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, so if there is nothing else before we move to the picks, then we can go ahead and do that. All right. So I will get us started. Uh, so this week I want to pick a novel that I've been reading. I'm about halfway through it. It's Kraken by China Mievel. Uh, I've mentioned him as an author before on one of the other episodes. And this is, in his typical fashion, very different than any of his other novels, but at the same time, the character of the text is the same. He does a very good job of using very innovative and ev evocative language. And it's a story, starts off, it seems like it's just going to be a regular kind of mystery story, but it very quickly incorporates a lot of supernatural elements that make it very compelling um, and it does a really good job of juxtaposing those elements against the normal everyday world that the story is taking place in. It's set in London. Uh, definitely a great novel. I recommend checking it out. My next pick is a series of books that I've been reading with my son called Heroes in Training and there are I think seven or eight books in total and they're all about the gods of Olympus at the age of about 10 and it's the story of them trying to overthrow Cronus. And so it's got a lot of good humor baked into it, um, very well targeted at a younger age range. So I've been having a lot of fun reading that with him. Um, along the same lines, there's a set of graphic novels that I've been, uh, that I got for him and I've been reading as well called Olympians. And the, I believe the author's name is George O'Connor, and it's just very well done, very well researched graphic novels that present the gods of Olympus. And, you know, I've done a fair bit of reading about different Greek mythology, and there were still a lot of elements that showed up in those graphic novels that I had never come across before. So definitely interesting, definitely recommend reading those as well. And my last pick, uh, kind of along the lines of our data focus here, is the Data Elixir newsletter. And it's just a weekly newsletter that has a bunch of links to interesting and useful articles about what's happening and the different aspects of big data and data science. And with that, I will pass it to you, Chris. So 
Uh, I was just in Vermont for a week. Uh, we typically go there every Christmas. And for me, Vermont is many things, beautiful scenery, great food, and also it is home of really, really great beer. Uh, so I have a few beer picks this time. My first pick is from a Vermont brewery called Hill Farmstead Brewing. And uh, the beer is called Edward because apparently that's their grandfather was named Edward. They made this ale in his honor. Uh, it's an American pale ale. Um, it's really interesting. It's It's got a really incredible aroma and it is really kind of hopsy and tart uh, with flowery and pine notes, uh, which I know sounds kind of strange drinking a beer with flour and pine, but it's actually really delicious and, and, and definitely worth hunting down. Um, my next pick is uh, Long Trail Brewing. A lot of people who live in New England kind of know Long Trail because of what they find from them in bottles and stores. And that's, you know, those beers are good, but if you ever manage to get to um, Bridgewater Corners, uh, where the actual plant is, they have a number of special beers that you can only get there on tap that are fantastic. The first one is called Culmination. It's a chocolate porter. I don't usually like chocolate porters, but this one is really exceptional. It's less sweet than the average. It's... Um, just got a lot of complexity and depth. It's it's really good stuff. The next one is going to sound really cheeky because of the name, but it's a really excellent beer. It's called uh, Space Juice Double IPA. Um, it is a seriously, seriously hoppy um, IPA, uh, caramel malts, um, really smooth. Uh, and I, because I was, again, I was there at the, at the, at the actual brew pub, um, they happened to have it cast conditioned on tap, which was just delightful. Um, so that's definitely worth checking out. My last pick is amazing, amazing, a Python pick. I usually don't have much to pick because usually there are smarter people on here than I discussing, you know, Python things that, they, that are much more interesting. But I just encountered something that really hit a sweet spot for me. It's called Flask-Restless. And essentially it allows you to take your sort of plain old Python classes um, and make them into a REST API. Uh, and what I really like about it is that it, in addition to being sort of very easy to set up and hook up, it interfaces with SQL Alchemy um, very nicely. Uh, what you end up with is a Flask application. And so all of the sort of you know other pieces of the Flask ecosystem uh, like authentication or whatever other kind of plugins you may want to use uh, will probably work. Um, so I've really been enjoying this. I've got a side project going that I want to write a web service for. And of all of the things of, of this ilk out there, this one just fit the best for me. Uh, that's it for me this week. Eves, what do you have for us for picks? Well, I have also a few books, actually. Uh, currently, I think it's a good time to read, <laughs> usually when there's kind of in the middle of the year and you're busy, busy working. Uh, but a fascinating book that I read recently is kind of, it's called The Willpower Instinct. Uh, I think it's around since quite a while. I think it was published 2011 by Kelly McGonigal. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating book about uh, how, how humans function, actually, and how you might uh, not be able to change your behavior, how, how you get caught in your habits and what's going on uh, chemically, psychologically. And I, I really, when I, I listened to the book, actually, uh, on my, my iPhone, uh, but I also read it on paper. But it was really like kind of <laughs> every chapter was like, I had a feeling at least about myself and, and how I missed recently doing this or that and so forth. So if you're interested in changing your behavior and, and or at least to understand um, how man, how human mankind uh, actually is working, this is kind of a very good book. Uh, the best, at least in this regard, I know actually. Uh, another book uh, I am reading currently is The Way of the Seal. It's kind of a nice book by Mark Divine if you want to get stronger and want to also kind of develop willpower uh, in the way the seals do. And I guess they're one of the best uh, elite uh, units in the world, actually, special forces. Uh, uh, so it's kind of also a good book, um, a little bit more practical one, and that there are many, many exercises how you can 
challenge yourself um, uh, to get maybe a better person. Another one, a little bit different, uh, is called uh, Sapiens, uh, the brief history about human mankind by Ivan Noah Harari, uh, kind of a nice book. Uh, yeah, from the very beginning, uh, maybe 20, 30,000 years ago, uh, Homo erectus uh, was around and the Neanderthals and so forth uh, up to today. So the scientific re uh, revolution actually is a very nice read. Uh, usually nothing I read, but again, during the holidays, uh, kind of very nice read for a little bit uh, better understanding uh, what shaped actually uh, our yeah, our species, if you like, like religion and agricultural um, revolution and so forth. Um, also very, very yeah, short while read, actually, very well written. And the last one is also a Python one. Um, I also had a Python pick. I, I want to uh, recommend the book High Performance Computing. With Python by Ian Oswald and, and Micha uh, Gorelik. Um, it's kind of a very good book from my point of view, which is not only about high performance uh, Python actually, but it's more or less about uh, yeah how Python, how the interpreter works, and and what is going on behind the scenes. So we discussed many many things uh, today in this podcast um, of how to make Python uh, more fast and so forth, uh, but. The very reasons and, and the workings behind the scenes when it comes to data structures, data storage, and, and the nitty-gritty kind of uh, details that you have to be uh, aware of if you want to go professional in this regard is explained very well from my point of view in this book. So I really like it, and uh, if you want to do Python for quant finance, this might be uh, one of the books that should be on your, on your bookshelf, actually. Very interesting. Well, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to join us and tell us all some more about your work in quantitative finance. Um, you've already told us about how to get in touch with you. So yeah, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening as well as your new year. Thank you, Chris, uh, Tobias. Thank you for having me. And yeah, happy new year and all the best for 2016. Happy new year to you as well. Bye-bye.